one of the persons came up to me and said, Father John, such and such personer said he will never allow you to do a funeral for him because you don't know how to do it. He said, Father, you didn't make the sign of the cross with a shovel on the four corners of the coffin. And fortunately, he didn't leave the church. But this is what you run into, where little things that you're not aware of that are different in each parish. Father John Flesser is a very experienced priest, as he has been a priest alongside his presbytera for over 50 years. For many years, he was the priest for St. Anna's Orthodox Church in Roslindale, Massachusetts. He currently serves and attends St. John the Confessor Orthodox Church in Ipswich, Massachusetts, and resides in the state of New Hampshire. As well as being a priest, Father John is also an author, as he has released his book, God Discriminates, to the public. God Discriminates is a book that has a compilation of articles written by laity and clergymen with an Orthodox Christian perspective about topics affecting modern society. Hello, everybody. Right now, we are not at the seminary. We are actually in, I believe, uh, New Hampshire. Is that correct? Hampton, New Hampshire. Hampton, New Hampshire. And this here is Father John Flesser. Very excited to have him on the show today. So I wanted to say thank you so much for coming on to the show. Well, thank you for coming and being here. We appreciate your visit. Okay, so we're going to do something we have not done on Tea Time at the Seminary. I feel like I've been saying that on a lot of episodes, but this one in particular, we're doing something crazy. Instead of hot tea, we're going to have iced tea. This is a preference by Father John, and it's summertime when we're filming this, so might as well have iced tea instead of warm. That's a good idea. Do you know what flavor this is? It's uh, red tea. It's a red tea. Okay, I'm actually, I've tried some of this before we started filming. It's quite good. I really <laughs> liked it a lot. Zero sugar, too. So, <laughs> all right, Father John, so I guess to start it off, first question, uh, how did you become a priest and how long have you been a priest? Well, how I became a, a priest is kind of a little bit of a tale here. Um, uh, I graduated from a college in 1957 and I was drafted into the army. And after spending my two years in the, in the military, I re-enlisted and went for another three years. And in that time, um, after we, uh, after I had re-enlisted, I ended up getting married in, in, in 1960, 60, oh, I don't know, 67. And we went to uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where I was, uh, went to uh, Officer's Candidate School. And then we went to Army Language School in Monterey, California. And then we ended up in Verona, Italy for two years. And after Italy, we came back to the States. And then I, while in Washington, D.C., working for the State Department, or actually in Washington, D.C., um, I went to this, uh, talked to the, my bishop, and we ended up, uh, he agreed about going to seminary. And so he contacted St. Vladimir's Seminary at the time. Uh, I went up for an interview and took a test, and they accepted me. And in January of 1968, I entered seminary and uh, was there until 1971. So it was a long, circuitous route to get there. Uh, I say we were in, uh, we, had been, we were in Africa for two years, and when we came back, and that's when we ended up uh, going to seminary for three years. Uh, and I've been a priest now for 52 years. And how did uh, going to seminary help you as a priest? Well, in, in many, many ways. And first of all, you have to understand that we grew up as Orthodox in the Romanian diocese. And so going to seminary was a shock because they had Vespers on Saturday night. And they even had the vigil, which uh, neither my wife nor I had ever heard of a Vespers or a Matins. Um, when I grew up, Matins was on a Saturday, Sunday morning from 10.45, or, excuse me, 9.45 until 10 o'clock. So when we went to the seminary, it was a real shocker that we had these services that we'd never heard of before. In addition, it was all in English. 
So that means we began to understand what we've been hearing in Romanian all our lives in a way we never understood before. So that was the introduction. Uh, and the value of the seminary was we heard the services in English. And then secondly, the classes. I had the opportunity to, to learn about our Orthodox faith. And three years is not a very long time. You can cover a lot of, a lot, a lot of material. Um, you have church history, canon law, you have Greek, where I, took, I had to take Greek, um, liturgics, uh, so, uh, and dogmatics. And so, at the seminary, it was, it was really learning another language because I came across terms I had never heard of. Essence, homoousius, apotheos, uh, nature, two wills, two natures, the Theotokos, the mother of God, the birth giver of God, and so on and so forth. All these words that we had never really heard about. And so for me, it was real learning her to come to know and it was like being immersed into a whole new understanding of what orthodoxy stood for. And I remember very clearly in, in my dogmatics uh, class, uh, my, the professor, Sergei Verhovskoy. And one day in the class, of course, he was talking about the, the church and the teaching of the church, that the one holy Catholic the apostolic church, the new Israel, and one day in class, he said to us, he looked at us, and he said, you are to become professional saints if you're going to be ordained. And you're to teach your people and lead them into orthodoxy. And I heard those words, and they resonated with me. Because as I was sitting there, I began to think to myself, if I'm going to be an orthodox priest, then I better accept what the church teaches about the faith. And so from that point forward, I made an effort to try to absorb as much as I could in the three years that I was at the seminary. So it introduced me to the fathers. It was an opportunity the seminary offers that you can't get anywhere else, which is you have instructors, you have teachers, you have an opportunity to ask questions, to explain a topic that you're not clear on. If you're outside the seminary and you're learning on your own, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. All you can do is read and read and, and get an opportunity to ask questions. So in this sense, the, it's invaluable. And the seminary in providing the resources for you to learn what you can learn in the brief time you're there. Um, and most importantly, the order of the services. The, to really understand what a Vespers is all, all about. Uh, uh, we had never heard, uh, as, I told, as I said, what a Vespers is or Matins. And then a pre-sanctified liturgy, we, we didn't even know what they were talking about. So it was an experience in which we learned something about orthodoxy that had been hidden away in the recesses of orthodoxy. So from this, it's invaluable. Um, but what you really learn in three years is that you didn't know very much because that's an awful lot of um, topics that you're covering and what you all you really do is just scratching the surface. And it's the lifetime of immersing yourself in the fathers and continuing reading and learning. Uh, and, and basically, one of the most important documents to read is the Holy Scriptures. Because when you read the fathers, and what I discovered, and even in the, in, with my dogmatics professor, oftentimes what he was quoting was from St. John Chrysostom. So it is important. And when you quote St. John, you're really quoting the scriptures. So for that, it was invaluable. And it's well worth whatever it was. All right. Actually, let's take a drink of the tea because we've never had iced tea before on the show. So I want to see what you think of it. <laughs> if we get to... Comforting. Comforting? <laughs> Cooling, okay. Uh, you talked about going, becoming a priest and then going to seminary. And then, of course, uh, you had to go to a parish. Right. So 
how does a priest handle going to a parish that's never had a priest before, or a new or a new priest at a new parish? Well, <laughs> the issue becomes one in which, when you go to a parish, one of the things you want to first do is ask, especially if it's an Orthodox parish, uh, one that's established in Orthodoxy. Um, today we're talking about a lot of converts, so it's a little different. Uh, where I went to were, were Romanian parishes that had been established for a number of years. So I learned early on, ask, what are your traditions? What are the things that, um, let's say, for a baptism uh, or for others, other uh, activities, what are your traditions and what are your practices? Uh, I was up in Manitoba and I had to do a funeral. And of course, the other thing you have to learn when you go to a, a, a parish, an established parish, I had to organize everything in Romanian and in English. And so it was uh, a dual effort. So I did the wedding, ser uh, the memorial service, the funeral service. And afterwards, one of the persons came up to me and said, Father John, such and such parishioner said he will never allow you to do a funeral for him because you don't know how to do it. And I was taken aback because I'd followed the book in Romanian. So I finally found him and talked to him. I said, excuse me, what did I do wrong? He said, Father, you didn't make the sign of the cross with a shovel on the four corners of the coffin. And I said, but you have to tell me that. These are not things that I know. And fortunately, he didn't leave the church. But this is what you run into, where little things that you're not aware of that are different in each parish. And so learn from them what, their, what are their local traditions. And if they're Orthodox, then fine. Uh, there's no reason to object. If they're not Orthodox, then you have to correct them. So what if you go to a parish and uh, you tell your parishioners to do something and they're kind of unruly and don't want to do the things the priest wants to do? Uh, you know, maybe, they, maybe the priest wants to have longer services and the parishioners are like, I don't want to do that. How do you compromise or how do you fix that? Well, again, um, the question, what do you do when they don't want to do uh, what should be done in an orthodox manner? I'll give you an, I, from two examples. One was, I was again in Manitoba. And <clears throat> the parishioners had introduced Protestant hymns in the liturgy. Okay? So we finally got them removed. But they wanted to have a, and I had a wedding coming up. So in the wedding, they wanted, here comes the bride. So I said, I'm sorry, we're not going to do here comes the bride. Um, now, these are foreign people, all right? Uh, they're men weigh 250, 240, 200. Uh, they're all farmers. And one of the farmers became very, very irate with me and told me, if you don't do, here comes the bride, I'll be at the wedding with a gun and you're going to be in trouble. Well, I said, we're not going to do, here comes the bride. So, unfortunately, the other parishioners calmed him down. And anyway, he got removed. That's the kind of issues that you run into, um, in which you have to begin to explain to them why these things can't be done. Um, you have to realize, especially, again, each parish is different, but in the parishes that I was in, they had been without really uh, teaching of Orthodox faith for a long time. The liturgy they had, uh, matins they didn't have, and all, a lot of the other services they got, had gotten lost. So you just have to be patient, explain, and ultimately, if, if you don't, can't convince them, that's where the bishop has to come in and help out. Um, and that's not always an easy thing. But uh, again, it all depends on, on uh, what you're dealing with. Another issue that you talk about unruly. In the Midwest, my first parish was in Terre Haute, Indiana. Almost all the men in the parish were Masons, Freemasons. 
And so I began the process of trying to explain to them why you couldn't be a Mason and be an Orthodox, which was not easy. Um, and again, uh, it only, it takes a long time. It's not, don't think that you can just say, well, here are the facts and present the facts and show them that they will immediately say, yes, Father, I'll do what you say. That's not the mentality in America, unfortunately. So it takes a great deal of patience and a lot of time to explain why certain things are not acceptable in orthodoxy, certain practices, whatever they may be. Um, uh, I say, ultimately, if you're going to have any success, it's going to come with the support of the bishop. And if the bishop supports you and supports the priest and supports the parish, the parish will slowly acquiesce and follow what they're being taught. Um, but that's a tough one. Because each parish, I'm sure many, many clergy have different, different stories about issues that have come up. So uh, probably the hardest thing you have to do deal with is, again, depending on what the ethnic language is. It, because uh, I had parishioners who would always complain about there's not enough um, not enough Romanian in the parishes because I was trying to do, introduce English into the services and uh, met a lot of resistance and so that eventually uh, I'd have both at the chanting stand I'd have the services all the services regardless of what they are Vespers Matins Liturgy I'd have English and, and Romanian and as an aside you have to realize this is back in the in the 70s we didn't have an English translation of anything. We had a hodgepodge of English translations. So for at the chanting stand, for you to have your books in English, you'd have to have three or four books just to get through one service. So it became a very complicated <laughs> and involved process. But again, it's with patience. And uh, I say a lot of resistance because everybody, is, we got to keep the Romanian in this particular case. And so one day I even asked this one gentleman, was vehement about, we don't have enough Romanian, and we need just Romanian. And so I asked him, I said, well, okay, fine. What language do you speak to your, your children, your grandchildren? English. I said, well, do they speak Romanian? No. Well, how are they going to learn about the faith? And I think that's a big issue that we're faced with here in America, in that it's important that we understand, and now we have all these service books available in English to, uh, to help slowly introduce English into the services themselves. Um, so that's a challenge here, I think. And this is why um, when you look at the, the parishes, the future parishes in America, are all going to be converts. So the language is going to be English. And it's not that we don't want to learn languages, but the language for the for the church is English, and that's what we have to proceed with, slowly. And you can't force it down people's throats. Um, kind of always have to have a little bit of a mixture, you know. Uh, even now, I'll serve in uh, Romanian, Greek, uh, uh, and uh, well, at least Romanian Greek. I can do Italian if I have to. So, uh, but you have to appreciate the people who are there, and understand that the. Some of the elderly folks still like to hear a little bit in their own language. So you have to take that into consideration. But most importantly, what's the future of the parish? What's the future of the church in America? It's English. So that's a battle we we're faced with. It was interesting. Again, I was up in Canada, and, and again, one of the individuals wanted Romanian and Romanian. And so I took the litany of the catechumens. Catechumens depart, all the catechumens depart, let no one remain catechumens. And so I read it to him in Romanian. I said, what does that mean? He said, I don't know. I said, well, you see, if you don't know, then how can your children know? It's important, not only that we have a language that we can understand, but how many even the English understand essence, hypostases, Homoousios, all right? Um, two natures. 
So it's important that regardless, even if we go to all English, we still have to explain what's being contained. Who's Arius? Who's Nestorius? Because you hear these names. What do they mean? Monophysite. All right, so it is important that we use the language pe people know, but we also have to e explain what this terminology is, why it's important. That's our faith. And ultimately, the real key in all this is that through the services, we learn the theology. You become a theologian, not just by reading a book as a help, but the theology is in the service books. Read, if you want to know about the mother of God, read the Menaean. Read all the services about the mother of God. I remember again up in Canada and the older, older women. And we'd hold liturgies during the weekday. And the women would come. And if we didn't have a chanter, the women knew all the services in Romanian. I once asked one of the women about the mother of God. She quoted me passages from the service books. She had memorized them. She knew more about the mother of God than the average person walking the streets. That's, that's how we have to assimilate our orthodoxy. It's not being orthodox, not just in name, but to believe and live by what, the, what we're hearing. Uh, again, I told the parishioners up in, in Canada in particular, because they kept pushing for Romania. I told them, I said, I'll do all the services in Romania if you do one thing. You follow the faith. You keep the fast. You say your prayers, et cetera, et cetera. I said, if you do that, then fine. I'll do it all in Romania. Of course, that didn't happen. Because, again, as I mentioned to you earlier, it was an eye-opener when I went to seminary to hear all this in English. And now to understand what it meant was even more enlightening that these things are not just books that we have, but they open to us a whole understanding of God and who he is and why he became man. So it's for this reason we have to do both. Use a language people know, and but explain to them the terminology that's new to them. You just can't open up the books and read it, right? Well, okay, so we're still talking about parish life. So what happens when somebody walks into a church, a new person, new visitor, um, and that person may be interested in the church, maybe thinks the iconography is nice, or they just wanted to check it out, right? So is it the job of the parishioners to go to this new visitor and uh, give the person hospitality, or is that really just the job of the priest and the parishioners uh, could help if they want to? Well... I guess each priest would do it a little differently, but because I had smaller parishes. But whenever I saw a visitor, if it was during a service and I had an opportunity during a service, I'd go out and introduce myself to him, get his name. If I couldn't do that, I always sent somebody, one of the altar servers, to go and get his name uh, uh, and come back and tell me who it was. At the end of the service, I would then announce, welcome, Joe. It's nice to have you here at church. And if I had an opportunity, if it was, uh, say, a liturgy, we go down afterwards, coffee hour, to sit down and talk with him. Um, you can have uh, somebody, it's, not, it's, it's something that may be uh, for one of the parishes to have a board, a board member, kind of, you see, yes, to go get the name and to send the name of the person up to the priest so he can announce at the end of the liturgy, we welcome such and such who's come to the parish today. Make them feel welcome. This is the, I know. What's interesting is that I, in, when I was in Boston at St. Anna's Parish, I'd have people who were sent from Greek churches to come to St. Anna's because they didn't, at the Greek church, they told them, well, we don't use, the, you're, you're not Greek, so you should go here to this American parish, right? So that's what you don't want to happen. You want people to feel welcome. And I, I've heard sometimes about ethnic parishes where people come non-Russian, non non-Greek, whatever, and they're not really welcome. So we should open ourselves. And uh, I say if, if it's possible, 
if you could have a board member, uh, an older person, to greet the person, get the information, send it to the priest, so the priest can let him know that he's welcome. Uh, we got to open our, our our parishes to the world out here around us, right? We want them all to become Orthodox. Father John, how do you balance being a priest and also having a family life? Because many priests are married and uh, have children even. Well, that's a very important question. That's a good question. Because this involves here issues that we're faced with today. In the, again, I'm talking about, I, I don't know, I grew up in a Romanian diocese. In the Romanian diocese, um, my beginning salary was $300 a month. Right? And I went up to three fifty dollars when I went up to Canada. And they provided a house, and, and a house for us and, and uh, heat and et cetera. But the issue becomes one in which for the future clergy in America, are they going to be working full time? Because most of our priests work full time. So you want the priest to be a full time employer, employee. You want to be a full time priest and a full time husband. Something has to give. And usually it's the family that suffers. Because for the priest, church comes first, God comes first, then comes family, and then etc. down the line. So that means that. There are a lot of sacrifices that have to be made. And I think it's for this reason, I would really recommend highly that the bishop interview all candidates, both the husband and the wife, together, and explain to them what he expects the priest to be do when he goes to a parish. If he's a full-time priest and, a full -time and he works full-time, think about it. The man who's working full time, he might get two weeks vacation a year, maybe three, if he's just starting out. If you take all the major feast days and you want him to serve all the major feast days, there go all the vacation days. There's no, no, there's no vacation time for the, for the family. So it is essential, and this is why I say it, I think it's crucially, that's the, cru crucial that the bishops talk to the future candidates and explain to them what their expectations are of the priest and also for the wife, the presbyterians. We have to understand, you know, what, what a priest learns in, uh, when he's in the, in the priesthood, when he's in a parish. And you can't really share a lot of things, a lot of information with your wife because you're talking to her in confession, you're hearing people. So you, you can't, be open with your wife all the time. And there are issues in the parish that sometimes there's no need for her to be privy to. I was fortunate because my wife and I, when I was working in both in the, in the military and the State Department, I had access to classified information. So I couldn't go home and talk to my wife about, this is what I did in the office today, dear. I read this top secret document, et cetera, et cetera. So, she learned there, there was just, there were things we couldn't talk about. And so the same thing applies here in the parish. The wife is the support and it takes really, she's the main support. She holds the family together. She's the one that's going to be sacrificing so much. So I think the issue becomes one in which here again, the bishops need to be very clear and what they expect their future clergy to do, how many services, what they expect if they're if they're working full time. What do you want them to do? In most cases, either they can have a vespers at least for a major feast day, or maybe if they're capable, they have a midnight liturgy, or else have a liturgy at four o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the morning before they go to work. So these are issues that I think the young, young future clergy have to be faced with. Uh, are they going to receive a salary? And how much? You know, one time when you hear a priest earns $50,000 a year, you think, oh, that's a lot of money. 
Well, today, in, in today's economy, 50000 if you're married and have a family, by time taxes and FICA and all the other things that come out, you don't end up with a lot. So these are the important issues that I think that the clergy should be aware of of what they're stepping into, and the wife in particular, because she has to learn to deal with all this. So for that reason, I would say it's important that with clarity, that be laid out for them what are the expectations both for the for the husband and for the wife. I think the some of the presbyteras have to have to realize that they don't have to become the mainstay of church school of doing this heading the women's group or whatever. And for them to understand, if they want, these are things they can do: become church school teachers and so forth. But it is important to help them, for the presbyteras, understand what the bishop is expecting from them as well. Uh, and they have to have a balance, you know. It's, it's critical. And I think it's especially now in as much as we's, we're looking at, as I say again, we're going to converse. Uh, so for them to be aware that these are the difficulties we face. If a young man is approached by a bishop, or, or men, I mean, young men as in like a man who's of age to become a priest. Uh, if a bishop asks a man to become a priest or to become a deacon, and the man doesn't want to do it, um, at what point do you say, okay, the bishop wants me to become a clergyman versus I don't know if I'm ready for that? I mean, because the bishop, uh, he wants, you're supposed to listen to your bishop, but in that situation, what if you think, I don't think I can do that? Is it okay to say no? Or is it, should you say yes? Well, I think more importantly, I would not just ask the husband. You better get a the wife has to sign a letter agreeing for you to become ordained. So you better talk to the wife too. And no, if, if, if you don't really feel, uh, I know I've had situations where I've been asked they were, somebody was going to be ordained. And I actually told the bishop, don't ordain him because they're just newlyweds. Give them a chance to have a family. It's too much to, to impose upon them to have a family and be, learn to be a, a, a clergyman at the same time. Uh, so if the person doesn't feel that he's ready for it, then he should say no and say his prayers. Pray, ask God to enlighten you to see what it is that might be the best for your salvation. Because if you're really not willing to pick up your cross and to follow Christ, then be careful. Yeah. But again, that's you can talk with the bishop too. You can talk to your father confessor. Uh, these are things that have to be worked out. And again, you have to bring the wife into it. She can't be isolated. She's part and parcel. It's a dynamic here. You know, a husband and wife are together. They're united in Christ, and so it's critical that both be brought into the understanding of what being expected of them. What are some ways your wife, the Presbytera, what are some ways that she's helped you during your time as a priest or just during your time being married together? Well, she's accepted what's come along, all right? Uh, look, she was from New York City and I took her to the little Terre Haute, Indiana uh, as, as a clergyman to Canada um, you know, to a different, we've traveled all over the place with minimum income. We, when our son was in, <laughs> in school in Terre Haute, Indiana, we got notes from the teachers saying, we say that your income is so low, you're uh, eligible for the Head Start program. If you want, go feed your son at school. And we wrote back and said, well, thank you very much. Go feed our son at home, you know. So, uh, except you have to accept your circumstances. It may, you may not always have all the funds you like. Uh, it, sometimes it's difficult. People criticize you. Um, and the wife really has to be patient and long-suffering and accept. Uh, and that's why it's critical the husband and the wife have to work together. Uh, if, you, if the husband, as a priest, doesn't have the support of his wife, it's going to be difficult um, because the wife is there 
she's there. But just a, it's interesting. What you'll find out as a as a parish a parish priest who's married, a lot of the women will come and talk to the wife and explain to the wife, I've got this particular problem, whatever it might be. And so she expects the wife to come and tell the husband because they may not feel comfortable enough to talk directly to the priest. Uh, again, this is another side to being the priest. For people to go to confession and confess their sins is an extremely delicate process. And so for a priest to come and approach it with a sense that it may take a year or two years for people to fully feel comfortable. When you're going to a parish, uh, let me preface that. When you go to a new parish, all of a sudden, uh, again, you start hearing confessions. Again, I'll use an example of Canada. And Lent had come up. And so they made arrangements for confession. Well, the church was filled. And so people, I had the icon of Christ, and people would come stand from the icon of Christ and confess, confess to me. They had never been to confession before, or at least they had been to confession before, but they had never been to confession where they were talked to when they were asked different things. Because as the evening pro progressed, and people were waiting to come up to confession, you'd hear, oh, boy, he was up there for four minutes, five minutes. What's he saying? All right. So for a new priest to go into a parish, don't expect that people will willy-nilly run up and want to confess because it takes a while to cultivate a, an understanding where a person really opens his heart to a priest. It's one of the most for me, one of the most trying and important part of being a priest, to help somebody open up and open their eyes and see if they've done something wrong and to admit it before God. So, and that's why here uh, it's extremely critical to have uh, the support of your wife, the support, help people understand what it is you're doing. I know, again, in some parishes, it took me over a year before uh, I was able to finally get through to somebody. He told me something, uh, his sins, he'd been carrying it for 25 years and I never confessed it. But it took me almost a year of seeing him on occasion throughout the year to where it's like, and when he, when he confessed, uh, you just see, like, oh, it's gone. It's gone. So, again, that's just, it's, one has to be patient and take time. It's not something that can happen quickly. I'm sure with most priests, they have situations where people come in, they have confession with them, and the person who's saying the confession is not feeling a connection with the priest, or they don't feel like the priest has enough empathy uh, for them. So. If you're in a situation where someone comes into confession or someone just speaks to the priest and says, Father, I like you as a person, but I just don't feel like we have a connection. How would you respond to something like that? Well, first, they're not confessing to me. They're confessing to God, number one. Secondly, more importantly, to hear their confession. And I've told people, I said, what do you come for? Uh, you know, you're here to, to open yourself up. Whether I say anything to you or not, what's important is that you've opened yourself up before God. And hopefully, uh, and, and I would suggest that people, a, a priest, read, uh, I met Paul Anthony Karpovitsky's book on confession, on how to prepare oneself for confession, especially for some of these very issues you're talking about, so that you, you learn here uh, to patiently listen and talk to people. Um, sometimes you don't have to say anything. Uh, sometimes it's just a matter of being patient with them. And hopefully with God it enlightens you to be able to say a word or two that strikes home. Uh, 
but if it gets to a point where the person doesn't feel comfortable at all being with you for whatever reasons, then you can tell them, please, then if you want to go see Father such and such, please do so. Okay? Um, I, I haven't run in that too often, but there have been times. Um, but that's, um, right now we don't have a lot of priests around, so there are not too many selections. Again, this, this becomes an issue when the priest goes into a parish. How do you get the people come to confession? Okay, I, this, I don't know whether they go over all this in seminary or not, but these are important things to be able to, do, to for a priest, or it's kind of on the job training. Okay, um, as a corollary, I think it's also very important for the priest to become familiar with the canons of the church. And not just to quote the canons, but to come to understand how they're applied. Because you just can't take what the church is saying in the canons and absolutes. And I hope that some of that is touched upon. There's not a lot of time at seminary for all these other things like this. It's not, there just isn't time for it. You have all the academia and everything else going on. But these are important things for the priest to understand the canons, how are they to be applied? And there is economia, and how to use the economia. And for a priest to also learn to be able to search out and ask other clergymen or ask the bishop, I'm not sure how do I have a situation without going into detail. How do I apply this or that? Um, because a confession it's like a very fragile soul that you don't want to add too much straw that can break the, break the soul. So it has to be dealt with very cautiously and slowly. You want to be Orthodox? Be Orthodox. Then follow what the church is teaching. Seek purity, seek virginity, seek chastity, overcome your passions, which is the opposite of what the world is teaching. But it's this that we offer.